This is Armin Morud from Norway. You're listening to Talking Blues. I understand you grew up on a farm. What kind of farm was it? Well, uh, we grow uh, oats up there. We used to have uh, cattle and sheep and, uh, and all that. But that was before my time. Uh, so now it's all just oats. So, you know, uh, growing up, I, I was driving the tractor. I had to go to school, <laughs> although I didn't want to, you know, and um, play guitar the rest of the time. You started really early. That, that This is because yeah. of your grandfather, is, is that correct? That's because of my father. He he used to be in a big band, and he's a big Neil Young fan. So he had, like, first a big band, then uh, I was born, and my brother was born two years later and uh, he couldn't spend as much time on the road well he wasn't on the road like i i've been on the road but you know he he was playing weekends and all that you know and um so he kind of backed off away from it and uh, but there was guitars everywhere in the house you know so i actually had my first gig when i was two <laughs> <laughs> uh do you remember that gig no nah, but you know they <laughs> they told me uh, my my grandmother worked at this nursing home, and I was there, you know, and I was wearing a cowboy hat and had a small guitar, so I just got up there and played. And there was a priest there for some reason, and and they asked me what my, what my name was, and I told them, you know, that I was this kind of famous Norwegian cowboy country singer, <laughs> and I, you know, I, I was him, you know. But but didn't In your grandfather mind. build you? Um... A guitar out of fishing wire and yeah, pieces of wood? that's right. That's right. He made me my first Stratocaster. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> for plywood and, uh, you know, for the volume knobs, it was um, the wheels from a toy car, you know. <laughs> okay, so you're that's gigging at the age of two. You yeah. start seriously playing guitar at the age of six or seven, correct? Yeah. Well, yeah, around six. Well, when I was the first, uh, I got my first, uh, you know, like a six string guitar for Christmas. And, and it kind of set me off. I presume because your dad was a big music fan, you heard a lot of music in the house. Yeah. And he had cassettes, you know. And uh, back then, he, he used to work at um, 3M, you know, the, yeah, yeah. the big medical and everything company. And yeah. they were selling recording tapes. That's right. Yeah. And some guy. Huh? I remember that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the C90 and the C60 and all yeah, that. Yeah. And and, and uh, some guy uh, was recording vinyl onto the tapes. So he came home with cassettes. You know, it could be it could be anything from George Michael to the Beatles or Stones. But, you know, there there was a lot of music around. And um, they were rehearsing. They had a Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young project, and they were rehearsing in the basement. So when we had to go to bed, you know, I, I could still uh, hear him <laughs> rehearse, you know. And the guitar player in that band, band was uh, like the first Stratocaster i ever seen. You know, I, I still remember opening the case up and just looking at it, you know. It was holy, <laughs> like a spaceship. <laughs> what did your dad play? Well, he played acoustic guitar. Okay. And in the yeah. big band as well? No, he played a trombone. And he was also the arranger for the horn parts. And then he played in your early band, did he not? Yeah, because my brother is two years younger than me. And um, so he kind of, well, he kind of had to play drums because uh, I needed <laughs> I needed a drummer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we needed a bass player. So uh, our father taught himself how to play the bass. And uh, we had like a family trio there going for... I think it went on for 11 years. Wow. And he played the bass. What yeah. kind of music was it back then? It started out being uh, like Neil Sedaka, Shaken Stevens, um, Everly Brothers, um, and Shadows, you know, played Apache and all that. Yeah. And um, at the age of 10, I heard uh, the blues for the first time, you know. And it changed my changed my life, obviously. Um, paint that picture for me. How did you hear it? What what happened? Who did you hear? It was, you know, it was uh, strangely enough. It was at their local shopping mall. It was a talent show, 
and uh, we were participating in the talent show with our trio. And I play guitar down on my knees. You know, I, I remember I was so nervous. I almost peed myself. You know? <laughs> I was, uh, <laughs> I think I was uh, about eight years old and my brother was uh, six. So the drum stool was so high, you know, he had to bob from side to side <laughs> to reach the bass drum pedal and the hi-hat. <laughs> and then... Um, a guy called Doug Finn Hovin. He turned out to be a great friend of mine, uh, an amazing guitar player. He was like two years older than me, and he played uh, actually what was the first twelve bar blues I ever heard with a guitar solo and everything. And I was like, "What is this? I have to find my, find out more about this. You know, what is this?" And uh, then at the same time, the Swedish television. Uh, had um, a documentary, but you know, back then with the linear TV, linear TV, you know, it just if you caught it, you caught it, and if you didn't, you didn't. Right. I turned on the TV, and there was Buddy Guy, and you know, my 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 hair is just standing up while I still, as I'm talking about it, and he was playing. I think it was that clip from, um, uh, you know, first time I met the Blues, when they're drowned on the streets of Chicago. Yeah. And it was just, uh, it shook me to the core, <laughs> you know, what is this? And then for that Christmas, I uh, I got a John Lee Hooker compilation CD. Uh, and, you know, that was it. I was just, uh, yeah. So, you know, when I, <laughs> I mean, two great legends in the blues, but very, very different kind of blues. Mm -hmm. Did you connect with both immediately? Yeah, I did. And, and and also, you know, back then, it, if you had if you had a record, if you had a CD, uh, that was probably the only CD you had, <laughs> you right? Know? So you spent a lot of time with it. You know, I can still to this day mimic all the almost all the guitar solos from um, "Damn Right I Got the Blues" with Better Guy when Clapton comes in on in um, uh, that song early in the morning. Yeah. You know, all that kind of, when, when Robert Cray sits in with uh, John Lee Hooker on the Boom Boom record, on the same same old blues again, when when Jimmy Vaughn uh, plays uh, on that boogie, when, you know, all those, you kind of, uh, when you close your eyes, you kind of are transported to that place, you know. And, um, yeah. How easy was it to learn that? Because when I when I talk to older musicians, they talk about using the the needle of the record player and playing it back and forth. And yeah. by your time, it would have been CDs, correct? Yes, and and cassettes. Yeah. So how easy was it to learn those licks? It was just a jogging the jogging function, you know, on the CD player. Uh, but I I don't think uh, some stuff you learn kind of note by note but i think my general philosophy since that has been like uh, trying to steal as much inspiration as you can but you don't have to steal it note for note you know right um so i think i i think i kind of try to tap more more tap into their uh what they were coming from or what they wanted to say and kind of steal that kind of thought process in, in a, you know any way i could and then try to make it my own. I was a big, yeah. So well, what I find interesting, because I came to the blues relatively late. I mean, and whatever mm -hmm. blues I heard before was more rock based and I didn't know it was blues. But I always find it interesting when young people connect with the blues, because to me, the blues is somewhat mature and it yeah. talks about yeah. mature things. It talks about life experiences. So what do you think yeah. it was that, that at such a young age that it connected with you? I think you know. I think it it is because I I was I've been growing up with with older older men, you know, through my grandfather and uh, his friends going moose hunting, <laughs> you know, uh, this agricultural thing. I think my soul has been really old all my life, and I'm think I think I'm maybe getting younger as I'm getting older. <laughs> you know, that's a good I, thing. Yeah, it kind of is. <laughs> And and I was kind of, I think I had that mindset because at the same, 
at the same time as I kind of was struck by the blues, I also found uh, country music and Dwight Yoakam and Merle Haggard, Johnny Cash, uh, it, but especially Dwight Yoakam and Merle Haggard. And, you know, there's, it's the sadness and the hope and, you know, it's the vulnerability through strength. You know, it's, it's that mix that was kind of talking to me. You know, it's, it's okay to be vulnerable but it's the way you carry it, you know? Um, how did you discover the like country music? How does that happen in Norway? Well, uh, actually through uh, uh, this fantastic band, it's called Hellbillies, and they're, they're singing in Norwegian, but uh, the musicianship is just remarkable for any, any country. And... So it was through that, you know, because they did Norwegian versions of uh, like guitars and Cadillacs and uh, just this fantastic guitar player. And, you know, I was I was hooked, you know. So this was early, early 90s. Yeah. And I'd imagine very early on you were probably found. I mean, you would never be seen without a guitar. But no. tell me. Tell me, at what point did you think this is what you wanted to do? That was really early, too. You know, I, I can still remember being around 10 or 11 years old, playing for hours and hours on end, uh, closing my eyes and kind of imagining being on stage, you know, kind of the whole, the whole electrified thing that happens when you're on stage and people are listening and, you know, there's... It's loud and it's noisy and it's kind of untamed, um, which I didn't know at the time. But, you know, that was kind of what I wanted to. I wanted to be that guy, you know, who could make that happen. Were there was, examples you know, of seeing people that you wanted to, that might have given you an impression of that's what I want to go after? Yeah, there was, um, again, uh, going back to the Norwegian scene in in. Um, in 1996, uh, we had a big blues boom in in Norway because of one guy, really, uh, Vidal Busk. And uh, I remember seeing him uh, in 1996 at this local pub, kind of close to where I live. And um, he was just, you know, he had a he had a hair, the guitar sound. He was, you know, he was as cool as Jimmy Vaughan. You know, he was like super cool and like super. Was so great at everything he did, you know, and even he, and I'll, I'll never forget because he played a whole night of West Coast swing kind of blues. Then he kind of ended the night with a Lonnie Mac, Steve Ray Vaughan kind of lick, you know, so, ah, of course, you know that too. <laughs> and obviously, you know, he, he knows everything. And we also struck up a friendship later, but that night I was 16 years old and he let me sit in. And uh, because I was then, Becoming like a, uh, I don't know, a, a kind of a young, promising talent mm. over the years. You know, we made some cassettes of our own <laughs> and uh, released a CD. And we, we went on national TV a couple of times and, and uh, played the blues, you know. But that was like, a, that was a big thing. And also seeing Eric Clapton, same year. Can you give me an idea of what you would have imagined being a professional musician to be at that point? Like how, like, I guess I'm, I'm interested in knowing, you know, obviously playing and whatever, but yeah. as somebody from Norway, did you imagine to be touring all over the world or did you think that you could make a career touring Norway? Like, did you, or did you even think that way? I don't think I thought that way at all back then. Uh, you know, I had a very limited uh, perspective on, on on uh, on on the that kind of job opportunity, <laughs> if you want to call it that, uh, and I and everybody you know, everybody kind of told me that you shouldn't go down that path because there's so many others that want to do that, and uh, and I was you know I'm kind of a polite guy, so I said yes, I I know I understand <laughs> it's it's probably not a good idea, you know. So, but when you said that path, do you mean <laughs> blues or do you mean music? Well, yeah, music in general, and especially blues, uh, because it's uh, it's such a small genre. Uh, but at the same time, 
because of uh, Vidar and and what happened around him, um, he was like the first Norwegian pop star uh, playing blues, you know. And we don't have had any, had any sense, but he's it. All these blues clubs popped up, and and all of a sudden you can be playing all the time, you know. And a few years later, uh, my brother and I we went to Oslo. Where I went, I went first actually because I I got my driver's license at eighteen. Right. Uh, <laughs> and you're like so an went, hour and a half away from Oslo, right? Yeah, it's it's not even that. It's like forty minutes. Oh, okay. So it's kind of close. Uh, so I went to Oslo, and and in Oslo. There was this magical place there for, I think the place was around for seven years. It was called Muddy Waters, and it was a blues club, right? like a small blues club, and it had live music seven nights a week. And that's rare, you know, mm-hmm. in, a, in a place like, like Oslo. And um, we went in there, and I, uh, I sat in at a jam session, got to know this guy called R.C. Finnegan. He was a songwriter, uh, originally from... I think he was from Texas, but he kind of never gave it away. <laughs> and he's he's uh, he's gone now, you know, rest his soul. And um, but he was kind of a mystery. But we ended up becoming the house band on that club. And I was around 19. Uh, I called my brother up when he was 16. Okay. Wasn't Kid Anderson part of the house band there? Exactly. I took his job because he <laughs> went away. He went to the States. Yeah. So, and you know, did I well for himself. In. Yeah, he did well for himself. Oh yeah, he did. Oh, <laughs> and he's still doing very well. He's fantastic. Yeah, I still every time I hear him play, it's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Is that possible? Ah, <laughs> oh, he's great and and um, a wonderful guy. So he, you know, he go into the states, kind of open up a little career opportunity for me, and my brother. So, but, okay. So I wonder, before this, did you not mm-hmm. go to Notodden and attend the blues music program? Yes. Tell I me did. about that. I mean, that's yeah. and also at a very young age, right? Yeah, I think I was uh, twelve, or maybe I was fourteen. Um, of course, before internet, uh, my father found out there was a a blues seminar summer school at Notodden, which is like two and a half hours away from us. And um, my friend uh, Simon Taylor, uh, or Simon Older, he played piano in our our band back then. And I think we were both 14, and we went to to stay at these cabins, and we had a, a little blues school there, yeah. It was like the first taste of um, the notion that uh, somebody else also could be interested in this kind of music because going to, <laughs> you know, going to school, being into BB King, listening to Live at Regal, uh, while well, everybody else was listening to, uh, you know, uh, what were they listening to? Um, <laughs> you know, Nirvana, yeah, which yeah. I came to love a lot later. <laughs> You know, and, and when you got younger, Brother G, Brother G, yeah. <laughs> Later, when I was younger, <laughs> I came to love Nirvana too. You know, so uh, it was re- really cool to to uh, to see that there were kids playing instruments. But you know, to me, there wasn't there was they wanted to play some funky blues, but you know that wasn't blues to me because that was really strict. You know, it was either jump blues, to slow blues, really, <laughs> or the shuffle. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> interesting. So I want to come back to that. But what yeah. did you get out of that course or that that experience? What do you do, what do you still carry with you from that experience? I carried with me uh, uh, the fact that it you know at this early stage for me, it just the, the fact that more people was interested in you know making sounds, making music, and playing together, uh, and also we had some amazing teachers there was a guitar teacher there uh, he was from denmark i uh, i hadn't f- figured out his name um now it's it's been so been so long but you know it's just hearing him play at that level um was mind-blowing you know how good how good is it possible to get you know <laughs> so it was um it was a broadening it was a broadening of the horizon definitely and, and did you wind up attending the 
the festival? I mean, it happens right before the festival, does it not? Yeah, it happened uh, the week before. Uh, and I can't rem- I, I honestly can't remember. Okay. I don't think we went. I think this was so early in their uh, develop the uh, them developing the, the the blue school that you know the the kind of I, I I know they do that now. They go to the festival and I think they also have a little concert. This was really early days, you know. This was ninety three or ninety four, early days of the blue school. So. Um, I don't think we went to the festival, but I could be, you know, I could be wrong. <laughs> so what I remember is I had a four by 12 Marshall cabinet <laughs> and, a, and Wait, the that JCM like the blues. <laughs> What? That doesn't sound like the blues. <laughs> no, just, I was also into, uh, I was also into Gary Moore, you know, Steve Ray Vaughan, Gary Moore, uh, Eric Clapton. But, you know, I, I, this was a time I, I knew so little, you know, but I, I, I saved up my money. I bought this guitar rig. I can still remember the smell of the Marshall cabinet, the Tolex from the Marshall cabinet. I, uh, <laughs> but then it started distorting and I actually thought there was something wrong with it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what, that was how, how, how little I knew. How much live so, exposure did you have to, to? Sorry, how much exposure did you have to live blues music? Almost, almost nothing. So it tell was, me um, about a time when when you got that exposure, and maybe the Clapton concert. But yeah. tell me about the time when you thought, "Wow, this is more than I expected it to be." Yeah, I think that was definitely the, uh, my my dad took me to uh, also Spectrum when I turned uh, sixteen. Uh, to see Eric Clapton, and I was a huge Eric Clapton fan, and still am. Um, and then I saw this Fender Twin was tilted on the side. You know, the the house lights were on, and and uh, it's like, hmm, what is this? You know, and out comes Clarence Gatemouth Brown. He was the opening and, act. Yeah. Wow. And I've been listening to his albums also for some years. Then you know. Uh, and he opened up, and I kind of, you know, Clapton was great, but but I think it was Clarence Skidmouth Brown that kind of blew me away that night. I can yeah. see why. Yeah, and we were we you know, we were far in the back, you know, but still, um, when you're that interested in something, it's like wearing natural binoculars, you know, yeah, yeah. Kind of you zoom in, and everything <laughs> else is a blur. So okay, all I so heard was him. when you <laughs> did the house band. At Muddy yeah. Waters. Mm-hmm. Um, tell me about that experience. Because obviously you're playing a lot. But you're also being, I presume, the backup band for touring musicians. Yeah. And that was so interesting because we got to learn so many songs. We got to play with so many artists. Uh, one night, uh, Brian Setzer walked in. And <laughs> and and uh, he wanted to sit in or, you know... The way it always is, somebody else really wanted him to sit in. <laughs> so I, he came on stage. I gave him a, a Stratocaster. He plugged it into a Fender basement. He, he looks at my Strat and says, well, this is not my brand. <laughs> then he played his ass off for 60 minutes with us. And uh, a couple of weeks later, uh, I buy the Live from Japan tour DVD. Right. And it was like, wow. <laughs> because I was kind of late to the party with Brian Setzer. So I, f- I played with him first, was really impressed. Then I bought the DVD and I you know, I was blown away. So by, <laughs> really. by this time, are you thinking I'm going to be a full-time musician? Uh, at this time, I uh, it was like this. Um, because I, had, um, I, I was done with school. Then I refused to go to the military as many musicians do you know so i had to work at this uh high school for a year but then the gig at muddy water started so uh i played five to six nights a week there three sets a night um and then you know uh sunday was jam night monday was country night so you know because we played some country music too (laughs) and then it was tuesday maybe with my band because the, my brother and, and the bass player, Bill Troiani, uh, we turned into my first solo 
band. Then it was Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday with um, a new artist every month or with somebody else that was from here. So um, it was just an, an amazing time. You know, you, you got to cut your teeth every night. And back then, you know, every slow blues was like a <laughs> a rocket launch, you know. <laughs> it had to go right and you had to put all your fuel into it, you know. Um, okay, so at some point, and I'm not sure about the year at this point, but you wound up going to the IBC, the International Blues Challenge. Yeah, yeah. I'm so glad we have this talk because there's so many things I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it's good so, to catch up. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about that experience. How old were you? What did you expect? What What were you hoping to see? Well, I think that was my probably my first exposure to uh, relevance. Uh, you know, coming there, uh, I, this was in 2002, so first, I was 21. First time in North America? Yeah. Okay. First time. And... Um, and and uh, we played two nights uh, on Beale Street, which was great, you know. And and we like we did what we always did and all still do, you know. We put everything into it. We kind of went for it, and you know it was really cool being twenty twenty one years old or and being recognized on Beale Street. It was like, hmm, this is great, <laughs> <laughs> and the barbecue is amazing, and wow. Um, but you know, I, I kind of early on understood, uh, that we, we didn't stand a chance and of course we didn't because, you know, the, the cultural background and the reason for, uh, exercising this genre is kind of, it takes many, many years before I think we can, um, uh, kind of try you uh, use different musical expressions uh, because you know feelings doesn't know a place feelings are mutual uh, and doesn't you know you don't have to come from mississippi to play the blues but i can totally understand uh that you have to come from mississippi to play that kind of blues or right. you know so i think that was my first impression was that uh it's great to be here and and there was a lot of great players obviously um but it was more of a learning it was more of a learning process instead of trying to take over the world, you know, as we kind of never did, <laughs> but we tried for, for 60 minutes. We tried, right. you know, <laughs> I wonder, cause when, when one studies the blues or gets mm -hmm. into the blues, one can't help but to go back to its history and to kind of get an, an idea of various cities and towns that have major impact on blues music mm. and I, I wonder from somebody who had never been to North America for somebody who's been into the blues for many many years um, what preconceptions you might have had about Memphis or the USA yeah. and getting that and what that was like first of all the first thing I noticed was the smell the, the air is so sweet you know and it smells like barbecue <laughs> Especially uh, on Beale Street, yeah. Which I, yeah, which I love, you know, the, the Blue City Cafe on the corner there. And, yeah. Uh, so it was like, um, it was like going to a, it's like going to a museum or something, just see, everything was wow, 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 wow. Because, you know, I think uh, American culture has been like probably the best promo uh, department that any anybody can want, you know, because it's so it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. We grew up on those mov movies. This is what a diner looks like. We knew kind of knew everything. Yeah. And coming there, we realized we didn't know anything, <laughs> you know. So I think it's easy to have like a certainty about our perspective of America, and it's it's just not right. And there's also. Uh, it's it's a of course it's not it's an evolving thing. So um, this is something I thought about a lot. You know, the last years, last ten years or something. That um, uh, being from Norway means that you're from Norway, and 
uh, doesn't necessarily mean that our perspective on uh, a huge influence like America is relevant. You know the, you know what I mean. Uh, yeah. It's 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 easy to think that you know it all, but you know, I live in Norway. <laughs> I read the news, you know, but <laughs> I'm still here. So, but know, I, I wonder. Okay, so, and and I know you don't just play the blues. Because, I mean, you play the blues, but you also play other types of music. Mm -hmm. But I, I wonder, a lot of it is, from my understanding, American-based or Americana roots music-based stuff yeah. that you do. Is it, in your mind, does it matter? Like, is there any part of you that says, I need to do something in the States? I, and I know you've played in other cities in the States as well. Yeah, yeah. But I wonder if there's a part of you that says... It would be nice to try to connect with that or make a name or go there and experience more of that. Or does it matter? Because in some ways, one could argue that musicians are treated way better in Europe than they are in North America. And there's something yeah. about the arts. And, you know, so as a as a career path, do you think I need to go to the States or no, I, I need to go elsewhere like other parts of Europe? Well... It's, you know, it's it's been a dream to come over and, and, and do something, but you know, the the scale of it is just it's so big. Where to start? Um I've been you know, I've been and I've been really busy for the last years in, in Norway because I wanted to travel less because I had kids. Uh that kinda put me in uh two hundred and fifty days a year in my car <laughs> going yeah. everywhere. Um but you know it's I have the feeling of trying to bring sand to the Sahara. You know, I also, I also toured uh, in, in England with my um, previous band, was well, my solo band. But you know, we we really tried to, to to uh, do our best, and we did. You know, we did okay. Uh, but still, there's is it, is it really a need for more? <laughs> <laughs> You know what I mean? Because my journey has been like I, I try to make, and I'm I'm trying to evolve and trying to make my own take on my musical influences. Yeah. Um. But it's uh, a part of me is kind of reluctant to try to go somewhere and sell it over eagerly because it means something else. Since I'm from Norway, uh. You know, it's it's the whole relevance thing. You know, I don't know. I'm still thinking about a lot of stuff. You yeah, know, yeah. like this. Well, but I mean, what what amazes me is with with the little contact that I've had with Norway is just how huge the blues is. I mean, the fact that you yeah. could have somebody from Norway have a hit as a blues musician, yeah. and the, the fact that you have a festival like the Totten Blues Festival, which yeah. is you know very well respected. Yeah. And the number of blues societies that Norway has, and the number of places that you can play the blues in Norway, mm. which is unbelievable for a country of what four or five million is that? Around five million. Yeah, yeah. I think we had uh, when it, when it was when it was peaking. I think we had like a hundred blues clubs. So, and could you actually make a living <laughs> just touring Norway for the rest of your life? Yeah, uh, yeah, I could do that. But I know and, that uh, it automatically translates into going to Sweden and Finland and whatever. And I know you've done some work in Germany and UK. Yeah, some, but you know, not a lot. Uh, I've been having. Uh, there's been people trying to do uh, right by me, but you know, we had some bad luck. Like um, on the on the, on one tour, the car broke down on day number one, and uh, my then manager told me, you know, I she took me aside and said. Um, you know the the guy that was, was supposed supposed to do the press uh, stuff for the tour. He hasn't done anything. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's been a lot like that. But, but we we played in uh, most interesting interesting thing I did. I feel was uh, we did a tour in Japan with um, Amgala Temple, which is a, it's a it's it's free form prog rock band so how does that happen now because those guys the the jazz they come from a jazz uh the 
jazz community in Norway. Right. Really well respected musicians. The two others, he's got it on drums and Lars on, on keyboard and bass. Uh, so they had contacts, you know. Lars plays in a band called the Yaga Assist, and they're uh, really big in Japan. So they had had some contacts, and uh, you know, we, we went there, played for a week. And I was walking around in my boots, you know, <laughs> always five meters behind them because I couldn't catch up with them. <laughs> so stuff like that. We in 2000, I'm jumping a lot now. I'm sorry. Um, no, no. In, in 2002, we played in Russia. That was really cool. We played in Moscow and uh, someplace outside Moscow. And um, up to that point, we only played for, you know, older people because it's an old older crowd right and we went outside moscow and they treated us like we were the beatles or something <laughs> it was just crazy <laughs> and we had to bribe the customs to get our guitars in there and you know what an experience <laughs> so when you have that can you not build on that like even i know it's expensive to tour and go to japan but you yeah. know it sounds like it was a very positive experience yeah, it was. Um, then is there a, a chance of going back to either Russia or to Japan? Or I think there might be. You know, if if I was a better businessman, uh, <laughs> I could probably make some something like that happen. You know, my uh, my answer to to um, to to you know my 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 way of making progress has always been to play more. Right. Uh, so I've kind of played a lot of places but there there hasn't been like this plan behind it you know you go somewhere if they wanted to come and and uh, you play your ass off and if they're happy and you're happy it's good uh <laughs> but but i wonder like I, I always find it interesting that some some bands um do well in other countries um and there's a lot of canadian bands that i can think of that does quite well in germany for some reason Mm. And and be totally unknown in the U.S., you know. Yeah. So, and and in your case, I mean, you're obviously doing quite well in Norway, and with yeah. the awards and the yeah, accolades that you get, is it does it seem weird to you that you know there are pockets of places that you do well, and it's hard to get into other parts? No, because when I um, you know, getting to know the music business over the years, I see the kind of effort that goes into a breaking new ground, you know, breaking new territory. I see the effort going into um, trying to play songs, uh, radio play. Also, I never had a hit. So, and that could be good or bad. And I chose to kind of try to use it for good because right. it means that I'm, I'm totally free. You know, I can do whatever I want. Um, but if I had a plan and maybe some people working towards breaking a new territory, you know, this is, I had my business cards printed in uh, 2020 <laughs> before <laughs> the pandemic, <laughs> you know, so I'm getting there very slowly, but you know, it was but, really but you've done well without the cards so far. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, so what, what made you get business cards? Because I'm not even sure people use business cards anymore. <laughs> I don't know. I was trying to branch out. <laughs> so it's um, it's an effort, but you know, um, I made some. I started making uh, some videos in my garage with some songs. I uh, like the one you heard. Yeah. Um, it's also like it's it's to to try to say hi and and uh, kind of reconnect with the world. And kind of reconnect with the world of when you know when it was uh, almost every day you showed people something because you played live, you know? right? So I've been playing up to five five gigs a night for twenty years, you know, and all of a sudden it stopped. But I made made a lot of new music then, you know. Um, how has that how has that affected you? I mean, it affects always, everybody, but I'm wondering. Yeah. It's been, uh, you know, of course, highs and lows and, and lows under that, you know. Uh, but it kind of taught me. I didn't think that I in existed as a human being unless I played all the time to kind of confirm to myself who I was and what I was about. Right. 
and um and when that kind of just went away like that um i coped with it better than i had anticipated really. by making more music making more music i still play the guitar a lot uh, and also making music in a, in a different way like i have a beautiful friendship with a, with a guy uh, called uh, Jay Everett he lives in Nashville and you know he's like my my big brother and we made an EP released it last year and we started recording in our studio here in Norway and then we kind of finished it over the internet you know <laughs> so it's still possible to be creative uh, I think th the thing I miss the most is not necessarily the traveling or the carrying of the equipment is more of the playing together with people you know that collective energy right that's you, what i miss the most do you think musically you're writing and playing differently because of the past year yeah i think so can you I think, expand on that in what way would you your playing be different i think the playing is uh different in in some manners because um you spend more time doing less. You know, you can focus on smaller things like your attack, how you hold your hands, how you make... You can, you can go looking for sounds in a whole different way. Hmm. And uh, I think I kind of... <laughs> it's going to sound weird, but in some ways the pandemic has been good for for my, my playing and... Uh, I, I found some new new ways of doing stuff. Also, you can spend more time writing songs. Um, you can spend more time writing lyrics, and um, you can go a little deeper. You know, you can stay in that zone longer. You know, because it used to be do this, then go to do a gig. Do this. You know, it's always back and forth, carrying, driving, and, and so. I don't know what the situation is like in Norway right now. What is it? So we're at the end of April. What What is yeah. Norway? Are you actually in Oslo or outside of Oslo? It's outside of Oslo. It's okay, so about forty minutes uh, northeast. Okay, so you're still where you were where you grew up. Yeah, kind of. It's twenty minutes away. Yeah. Okay, so what's the situation like in Norway right now in regards to the pandemic? Uh, well, the the numbers are going down. Um, the vaccines are coming, but it's really slow. And uh, so we're opening up uh, in a very, very slow pace. Um, you can have, I think you can have up to 200 on a concert now. Oh. But, I, but I'm not sure. We've, we've been uh, in, a, in a lockdown for for months, you know. But, you know, we we, we did, when, it, when you look at the world as a whole, we, we did really well thankfully and can you is there a, uh, a live gig in the foreseeable future well my, my calendar calendar has some dates but i don't look at my calendar anymore it's <laughs> it's just too sad you know <laughs> but so they, they... <laughs> like i'm surprised like right now i'm starting to see a lot of gigs in in the states mm -hmm. a lot of musicians are starting to do gigs or plan gigs yeah. Um, yesterday, Genesis announced their North American tour, which is going to happen in November. And I'm thinking, is this really going to happen? Yeah. Um, but is there like a, a date where you, you think, well, this was probably going to be possible or is it still unknown in Norway? It's still unknown. Wow. Yeah. And it all depends on uh, the numbers and they're going up and down. But, you know, the... the um, consistent trend is like downwards so it's looking better but we have we had a, quite a few openings and then shutting down again yeah, yeah so i think it's only it's a matter of trying to find a lifestyle uh, that doesn't necessarily re require you to ne read news all the time because <laughs> they're like the they're trying to sell newspapers you know yeah yeah so it's it's good now. It's great. It's it's bad. It's terrible. It's great. You know. <laughs> Have you written anything about this experience? Only the feeling of it. You know, the the song I released today was called uh, "All in My uh, All in My Head," 
And that song is about, you know, depression and uh, your head trying to tell you that you're not good enough and you're trying to fight that feeling back. It's all chemistry, you know, but it feels very real when it happens. And, you know, I've been so depressed. My, my, I changed my style of walking, you know. <laughs> Explain <laughs> that. Just, huh? Explain that. No, it's just sometimes when you're 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 just having a, such a bad day that you're 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 start to 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 reevaluate re- reevaluate the way you walk just to have something to to take your mind off how boring or how sad you are and um yeah it's just like that so when so you when you <laughs> get to like that cuz yeah. all of us do how mm. do you get out of it spending time with my wife She's my best friend, uh, going to the trampoline with the kids. Uh, and she bought me a moped, a scooter, <laughs> a little 50 cubic inches scooter. So I put on, put on my cowboy boots, a helmet, <laughs> and, and uh, I go on my scooter, you know, for hours. <laughs> really, really slow. I can go on forever <laughs> to see something else. Um, okay, when I when I look at your website and I see your different videos, I see also very different genres of music. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm if I'm not mistaken, and I'm, I might have missed one or two, but most of it is English singing. There is yeah. there's few yeah. that's I think Norwegian, but why You're is right. that? So like, is it is it a conscious effort to sing? And write in English as opposed to in Norwegian or? You know, starting out and since, well, for me, since always, the English lyrics has been so closely connected to the genre and what you want to put out there. Right. And it's the, it's the sound of it. Uh, but I made, um, I made actually one, one album. With my good friend Kim Bergset uh, in Norwegian, we we made songs to fit the the poems of a famous Norwegian poet, and that was really interesting because once you start singing in your native tongue, uh, people pay attention in a completely different way because English is not our first language. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, have you written other than using somebody else's lyrics? Have you li- written songs in Norwegian? I've written some songs, and uh, also during the pandemic, um, I made a made an album. It's not recorded yet, but I made a full album with um, uh, Norwegian lyrics, and it's a really famous Norwegian author called Lars Sobi Christensen. Uh, he, you know, he was bored, and I was bored, so he sent started sending me some lyrics, and I made some songs. It's gonna be uh, Los Lobos ish, kind of. Uh, with baritone sax and everything like my previous band uh, and I'm going to make a full album it's going to be I'm excited about that is it very different the thought process when you're now singing in Norwegian than you are singing in English or is that a stupid question that's not a stupid question at all uh, it's um, it's um, more daunting in a way because um you can cl- you can more closely relate to the content of what you're singing about, and also um, uh, a, a cliche, uh, a, a English cliche, is easier to swallow for us in Norway uh, than a Norwegian cliche, of course. Obviously, you know. So when you're singing something in Norwegian to a Norwegian, he's gonna go. Mm. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> but that's, I think that's maybe where it's at. It's that the, I think the simplicity of a good lyric, um, it's difficult to translate into your native tongue because it's, it could, all, it could uh, only sound simple, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, working with Lars, he's a, uh, he's fantastic. And, and um, that gave me a little, confidence boost when I wrote a Norwegian lyric and sent to him I was like yeah this is good you're serious <laughs> thank you <laughs> so it's uh yeah 
step by step. Okay, confidence. Tell me about confidence, because mm. obviously, I'm I'm pretty sure you're pretty comfortable with your guitar, mm. that you're a confident player. Yeah. But do you ever lack confidence in what you do? And I and obviously going through a time like this, one mm. can't help but to face that. But but does that happen? And musically, do you ever lose confidence? Oh yeah, all the time. And how do you and, regain um, it? What? How do you regain that confidence? I think confidence fills up uh, slowly as you're doing, maybe you're doing something else, like doing something to make you feel good about yourself. Uh, I think um, this last year has also given me some confidence in who I am as a person, as opposed to only a guitar player. Um, so I think when you're losing the confidence, try to, you know, do something else for a while, uh, like make a video or go on a bike ride or whatever, uh, or just play some PlayStation or, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it's, it's a difficult, um, it's a difficult thing to, to answer uh in a complete manner for me because uh i i kind of i'm allergic to failure uh and that's like something i have to work on <laughs> um, you know i i can't stand failing <laughs> okay but those, the people say and and mm. i'd like to believe that they're true but um that most of the successful people are successful because they've dealt with their failures mm. Um, have there been? Are, are you allergic to failures because of failures you've experienced, or is this just something you try to stay away from? I mean, we all do. But, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But when you say you're allergic to failure, where does that come from? I don't know. It comes. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I just, um, I just feel that I have to get it right, and also. I think it could be from a, from an artistic perspective, could be work, good to work on uh, the failure as a topic because I think through failure you can really find something else than if you're only staying in the middle of the road. You know? Right, and then so going back to the videos that I see on your website, yeah, you you and 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 as we've already talked about, you do more than one genre. Yeah, you know, and even the thing that you sent me. Um, yeah, it's quite different from other things that I see. So, yeah. is that is there any risk of failure when you when you when you have so much versatility? Does that ever is that ever an issue where you think, oh, uh, this is really not what people are used to me doing? Yeah, and and do you have hesitance in doing that, or do you think, well, this is part of who I am, just a different side of it? Yeah, but. Uh... I kind of experienced that kind of early because being a blues pedigree in Norway, uh, then I felt after a while there that um, the audience was kind of trying to take control over the stage. So you went to play a blues club and you had to play what they were anticipating you to play. And that was kind of fueling my eagerness to branch out and try different stuff uh and um and really important guy in my life has been bill Troyani, as i told you uh bass player from new york uh came to norway with tom russell in the 80s and he ended up being the bass player of my first trio at muddy waters and that was kind of the first time we started experimenting with you know he kind of taught us how to jam you know, stay on the one long enough until something happens, like this drony kind of blues jam. Right. Get away from the the twelve bars and all that. See, so I, my whole life has uh, been a search for my own way of playing blues based music, and I say, you know, I try to say yes to everything that sounds like something I've never done before. Stuff like uh, going to Japan with that band, we made an album. Uh, I went to Cambodia to play with a uh, uh, Dong Dongweng um, guitar. Uh, well, it's a folk instrument. Mm -hmm. Play with a guy called Kong Nai. He was blind and didn't play, speak English, and I was just there with my guitar, and we had a recording session. <laughs> we played a festival. 
<laughs> Wait, how does that yeah. happen? I just said yes. But he asked you. He just said, I mean, he obviously heard you and said, will you come and play? No, he never heard me. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But he, yeah, so that, that was um, a friend of ours were funding schools in Cambodia. So we went down there. My wife and I had a on holiday, and you know I found the jam session. It like it it happens, you know. Yeah. And then I was asked to come back and play uh, in in this this it was called the Friendship Festival in Siem Reap in Cambodia, with uh, Kong Nai. It was just this incredible experience of uh, finding the blues far far away, you know. Because he's a blues man, <laughs> mm-hmm. it's what he does is blues, and uh, and also we're going. We went to ho- on a holiday in um, Morocco, and I was listening to Gnava music. You know, blew my mind because you know that's also the blues. You know, so I hear the blues kind of everywhere. So uh, I've been trying to connect, and also that that video clip that um, Ed sent you was me trying to connect with the blues in Africa uh, with my deepest respect. And I'm not trying to, you know, getting in anybody's hair or anything. It's just, I'm, I, I love that expression so much. I had to, to, you know, try to learn some of it, you know? So um, it's, it's, it's a constant learning process. And I think there's so much more to the guitar than trying to sound just like Albert King, you know, but okay, that's so, cool. But you know, yeah. Well, when you mentioned in the very beginning, you were about, I, I would presume, traditional blues. You you did yeah, a certain yeah. kind, and you didn't want to drift away from that. So, what was, was it? Because of the audience at Muddy Waters that you thought I need to expand, or what made that change from the the kid who was very dedicated to traditional blues to who you are today? It was, um, I think, it was a sense of. Um, um, being young later, you know, I was old when I was young, then I was <laughs> younger when I was around 20, 24, 25. Uh, and, you know, I really, I realized I was being yelled at and, and they were giving me the finger uh, because they didn't think what I was playing was the blues. And I was like, well, I'll show you. <laughs> so we started. We started a rock band called The Grand uh, in two thousand and six, um, and and um, you know started playing more uh, psych rock. Yeah, uh, like well, it was it was kind of based up on uh, Cream and The Who and Zeppelin, and I just realized how many. S- how many things I had to take out of my playing to make it sound like a proper uh, 60s, 70s rock guitar, you know? Mm-hmm. Because I felt that blues scene, especially the the West Coast blues scene that was really infused upon Norway, uh, it was so much... Um, it was like watching a soccer game where everybody was kicking the ball with their heels, you know? It was just so many... So many <laughs> blows and whistles it's like this is not real anymore it's just nah and also i couldn't i couldn't relate anymore to the the lyrics because i didn't feel that way anymore i felt younger <laughs> so, <laughs> the benjamin button of blues you know <laughs> and i know the world has changed drastically but do you have goals at this point like if we would and we can't take away what happened in the last year but no. but if i was to ask you and and your trajectory of your career at this point do you have goals that you have that you want to achieve or and and if so how can you actually explain what those goals might be well my my goal now is to make um i have this project and it's been going on uh on the drawing board drawing board for for many years well some years uh it's called east west north and south and i want to go to four places in the world and meet musicians and uh, play together with them and make one album from each place. I'm just thinking about uh, Bamako uh, in Mali, in Africa, Uh, New Orleans, I'm thinking maybe Finland and maybe going back to Cambodia. 
you know, so my main goal is trying to um, distillate and make my own world blues. Where I hear the blues, I want to twist it and make it my own, you know. Um, why Finland as opposed to Norway? Uh, because I know some people up there and uh, there's something uh, there's something interesting happening there. There's this uh, it's the saddest of all sadness. <laughs> you know, it sounds like their, <laughs> their music is just wow, let's try to mix that with some slide guitar and uh, yeah. <laughs> what, why do you <laughs> That's, think that is? I mean, why is it so sad, you think? Is it because cause we don't the see the sun, you know? Right, but why would it be sadder than your country or Sweden? <laughs> it's, it, I don't know. It's even darker. Okay. You know, it's. Uh, I think a lot of a lot of Nordic culture comes from not seeing the sun more than yeah six months at the time, if you're lucky. Yeah. Um, now it's. Um, I think. F- I'm I'm probably wrong, but I feel that Finland is more co- connected to Russia than Norway and Sweden because Sweden is more connected to Europe, and and Norway is kind of it's an island in some ways, yeah. you know. You know, we're not a part of the EU, and it's um it's a different thing. Interesting, but um, yeah, that sounds like an interesting project. Yeah, I just I really hope I can get it off the ground and just uh, going going to Mali. It's probably it's advice it's advised against because it's really tumultuous there, and you know. Um, so now I'm looking into maybe meeting some musicians in London. I written a mail to Sahel Sounds, which I the record label. I love them. Um, so it's all this. You know, I'm. We we spoke of confidence earlier, and uh, uh, I'm I'm trying to. You know, I'm I'm getting there with baby steps. I'm trying to reach out, uh, show people uh, what I'm about, and um, yeah. Well, okay. Uh, um, <laughs> my final question, and thank you yeah. so much for doing this. I really appreciate well, you taking you. The time. Um, thank you. Tell me what music has given you. What's oh. the greatest thing you've learned from music? I think it, the, the sense of feeling weightless, uh, the sense of uh, leading, the sense of being led, uh, and the feeling of creating something that is bigger than you could ever grasp. And it could also be gone in one second. You know, it's... Uh, it's given me a life. It's given me a, an identity, and um, you know, I'm that guy I, with a tractor and a moped and a guitar. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Do you still have the tractor? <laughs> no, my father runs the farm. Thankfully, because we've been on the road since, ever since, you know. But you know, I, I still enjoy going up there, driving some tractor or cutting down some lumber. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Aman, thank you so much for doing this. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's great to talk music again. (laughs) Wow. Well, we can do it again. (laughs) Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. (laughs) 